big swings. Well, here it comes. Oh, my goodness. Have you seen anything like that? Big moments. There it is! Adam Scott, a life changer. All the news, all the views. The career grand slam. A launch to Cry Webb. Welcome to the PGA Golf Club. And welcome to the PGA Golf Club for another week. Adam White, Brendan Goddard and Dale Lynch with you for this week. And it is a really exciting episode because we are going to talk to one of the headline acts for this year's PGA Championship on the Gold Coast, 19 to 22 of December. Cameron Champ, one of the American visitors, as I said, one of the headline acts, will join us very, very shortly to talk about why he's decided to come down, whether he thinks the golf course will suit him, but more than anything else, just to find out a little bit more about Cameron Champ, the golfer, but also Cameron Champ, the person, because he has a fascinating story to tell, particularly just how far he hits the ball. And I think we're all going to take notes to try and get a little bit of extra distance into our own games by uh, having a chat to Cameron. Uh, Brennan Goddard, welcome to you. What, Adam? What intrigues you mostly about Cameron Champ? Probably just more of his kind of upbringing and before he turned pro and before he kind of burst on the scene with a win within his first half a dozen starts, I think it was, last year um, at the Sanderson's um, Farm uh, Open, I think it is. But So, yeah, just more about uh, his upbringing. Dale Lynch, what are you looking forward to talking to Cameron about? Well, I guess for me is that, that he won he won once on the what was the web.com tour and then came out and won in his first event on the PJ Tour and won again since. And having coached on both, it was the different type of golf courses on mm. the PJ Tour versus what was web.com and Nashua before that. For me, from my observation over time, there are players that are way better suited to golf courses on the main tour and someone hits it as far as he does. That's sort of that's that's the area I'd like to just uh, be able to fire a little question in there about that. Yeah, well, we'll talk to Cameron shortly. Uh, Michael Sim's going to join us as well. He won the WA Open over the weekend. It's great to see Michael Sim back uh, on the winners list. And again, a really interesting story as well, considering where he's been, where he was way back, and then where he's been, and then where he is now, and potentially what is uh, into the future with that uh, Michael Sim. And also, we'll have a chat to Craig Spence uh, from the. Uh, Albert Park driving range uh, with his latest tip of the week. But before we get to Cameron Champ, has anything sort of grabbed your attention in the world of golf, BJ, over the last week since we last chatted? Since the last week? Um, Not in your own game, but just in the world of golf. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I've found something. Um, <laughs> uh, no, the Australian Open field continually just gets better and better. Yeah. So that's going to be incredible to watch. I think, it, I think I'll be... Buying for a ticket to get up there somehow and potentially participate in the pro am, but um, well, since we last spoke, Adam Scott has joined the field, so yeah, yeah, so not that too continue. many big name Australians that are going to be missing from that field. Yeah, Mark Leishman, Cam Smith, o- Jason Jeff, Day. Jason Day, uh, Paul Casey, so a few Europeans that aren't a part of the yeah, Presidents Cup nice team, the international bonus. team. So, yeah. and then you got most of those guys playing Abraham answers back to um, defend his title. So, yeah, really strong field. So the summer of golf coming up. Now, with the inclusion of Cameron Champ at the PGA at RACV Club at Royal Pines, we've got a, a great summer of golf coming up. We haven't spoken to you for a few weeks. Is there anything, Dale, that sort of stood out that's captured your attention? Yeah, there's one. It's um, one Brendan Goddard just off air said he's actually found it. He found it on Thursday. So found for something. me, so for me, it's going to be. Has he actually found it? Like the, the next time, has I he, said this has to me. He goes, "Oh, geez, I've heard that before." <laughs> yeah, like we're all golfers. Uh, well, the, the real reason is that we played. Uh, it was actually the last time I played golf, and I actually outdrove him. <laughs> and uh, it, he was absolutely mortified. <laughs> well, he, he walked up to my ball thinking that it was his, and I said, "Brendan, yours is back there." So he's been forced to go back to the range and find the extra distance. We won't talk about the score at the end of the day, but uh, that's irrelevant. I hit past you. That's <laughs> or, all I care or, or about. Why don't hit driver here. It's not worth it. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll hit driver. <laughs> well, there's only one way to play. Yeah, no, I'll get in contact with you two later today. I'm just okay. funny enough going to the golf course after this to play in a, uh, a charity day. Um, but I'll be hitting balls prior and I'll, uh, 
I'll get in contact right. with you. Well, we've got a very spe- very special guest about to join us, but I, I did want to just mention a couple of things. I thought Justin Thomas winning again is really important yeah. for the Americans going into the President's Cup because he, I wouldn't say he'd lost his way, Dale, but he, he, he wasn't in his contention like he seemed to be every single week, and now he's, he's winning again, which is a bit scary. He wins a lot, doesn't he? He does. He What's does. Like and well. Yes. When he does win, and he, and he sort of when he's in when he's in the lead, he just like he just just finds a line. But he, but he was he? injured, had a wrist injury through the middle part of the year, um, and so his last kind of five, four, or five months has been mm. back. Just and you know, wrist injuries with golfers take yeah. some time and can be kind of career threatening. So it's good to see him back. But he kind of become a bit of a forgotten man because of what Brooks has done in recent times. Well, every, everyone kind of has, haven't they? Yeah, well, that's that's a good point. So I wanted to mention that. I also wanted to mention Cam Smith, who finished really strongly to get himself into sort of top five, top six in that event in Korea. But it was also great to see Lucas Herbert have another good result in the French Open overnight. He had a 64 or 65 on the Saturday to get himself back sort of in contention, held his position in the final round, but he shot 30 on the back nine at that famous golf course when I say famous where they had the Ryder Cup last year with Le all that National. War. yeah that's right but he shot Perry. 30 yeah, which is awesome. 5 under thir- 5 under which for is that a tough nine. golf course yeah. yeah that's a great effort so I think he finished just inside the top 20 so he knows that his card was secure for next year because there were some anxious moments sort of middle of the year but um, he's found some form late and he goes I'm assuming he would go and play in the Portugal Masters last uh, next week which is where he very nearly yeah, won it last mm. year before Tom Lewis uh, got him on the second last hole so Good to see Lucas. But more played Jason Day, kind of finding some form. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, Leash was playing, so yeah. these guys were amping up their schedule in anticipation for yep. the, the Presidents Cup. So uh, it's good to see Justin Thomas back, but <clears throat> excuse me, not from uh, a Presidents Cup's point of view because we no, we down right. here in a, we when I refer to we it's to the Victorians and Australians, we want to see a international win because I think that just finds relevance again for the yep. competition and what it yeah. is. So, um, yeah, so USA, yeah, Justin Thomas back, but it's it's not a great thing for the uh, President's Cup, unfortunately. No. All right, we've got a very special guest about to join us on the PGA Golf Club. And Cameron Champ now does join us uh, from the States uh, ahead of uh, a really exciting time for golf here in Australia with that news, as we said before, that uh, Cameron will be playing in the Australian PGA Championship. Cameron, thanks very much for joining us on the PGA Golf Club. How are you all doing? I'm happy to be on. Well, we're happy to talk to you. Uh, tell us about uh, the thoughts of coming down to Australia to play golf. Well, you know, it's, it's kind of always been a dream, kind of on my bucket list to go to Australia. And, um, you know, like I said, I got the opportunity to come play this year. And, uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to it besides the the long flight from the states, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. everything else. I'm I'm looking forward to it so much. How did the opportunity come about to come down and play? Um, well, I remember just talking to my agent. You know, there's always some opportunities playing overseas, and he kind of mentioned Australia. Um, and it came about, and we just kind of discussed it some, and you know, the opportunity presented itself. So you know, I thought, why not? You know, this this is this will be a fun trip um, to go on. You know, it's just gonna be myself and my girlfriend going. So. Um, it, it it should be a good week for sure. I'm not sure whether the golf course is going to be long enough for you, though, Cameron. <laughs> do you know much about oh. the golf course? <laughs> I do. I do not at all. No. Um, it'll basically be the first time I kind of look at it or or see it once I get there. Well, it does suit uh, someone uh, of, of your game. But um, what about what about last month's win, Cameron, at Safeway Open, and and how emotional was that f- for you? Yeah, I mean, it just. Um, I mean, like I said, I. I, I wasn't even planning on playing. Um, it was a, a decision about three hours before I teed off. I just drove down. Um, I didn't play practice round. I didn't hit one putt. I just basically warmed up, hit a few putts, and went out and played. Um, so, I mean, just to do it just the way I did, um, for me, kind of feeling like when I needed to at the most, um, it was just satisfying with that itself. You know, I had my family there and, um, you know, all, all my biggest supporters from back home and just be able to do it. Pretty much in my hometown, in front of everyone, uh, like I said, will go down as you know one of the greatest memories of my golfing career. What about so? What did you take out of it? Explaining what you, what you just did and the three hour drive, you weren't planning to play, but like mentally, you're obviously in a different space to what you normally otherwise would for any other tour event. What did you take out of it? And what can you move forward with? I think really just the mindset. I mean, it was a 
I mean, I had a lot of stuff going on, obviously, um, but I was just really just focused on golf. I wasn't really worried about other things, um, you know, other negativities. I was really just, you know, Kurt, my caddy, just kept me, kept us going. You know, we'd pick a club, pick a yardage, and, you know, you either hit a good one or you don't. You know, there's no getting upset about it. You know, I did the best I could at that time. And, um, you just deal with the result. So, um, like I said, I think just going through that experience within that week, um, it just helped me realize a lot of things that, you know, golf is golf. And, you know, once you're, once you sign the scorecard, it doesn't define who you are. You know, you're still, you're still yourself. And, um, you know, obviously it's, it's the career path I chose. It's the career I love, but at, at the same time, you got to separate both, you know, golf and personal life. Did you, did you feel like when you were out there, it was like an escapism and, and sorry to keep on harp on you, but the things that were going on behind the scenes, did you feel like that you could kind of use it as an escapism? Yeah. No, yeah, for sure. I mean, it was, like I said, it was when I was out there, I didn't really think about it much. I think the only time I did was um, Friday. Um, for some reason, it just got to me on the first poll. But, um, you know, besides that, it was it was ex- exactly what you said. It was kind of just an escape. Um, and then have my family there also, also helped as well. Uh, Cameron Dale Lynch here, uh, mate. Um, just uh, as an insight for you with, uh, obviously, uh, your style of game with uh, the, the power game that you actually possess, and you came off yeah. you came off the, um, uh, what was the web.com onto the, the main tour and, and won you know, straight out the gate. Do you find that, that the courses on the PGA Tour uh, with your length actually suit you better than maybe the secondary tour? Um. I would say so, just because obviously the conditions are a little bit different. You know, there's a lot more rough uh, on the PJ Tour. Um, but if you can drive it, you know, decently straight, you know, for a guy like me, you know, if I'm in the high 50% range, that's a good year. I mean, that's, you know, I, I, I still always look at a stat that Bubba did when he led in driving one year and he only hit like 47% of his fairway. So, um, you know, definitely out there, if you have a good hot week with the driver, um, yes, I think it's definitely an advantage for sure because then I feel like if you're hitting that well on, on a course that's decently tight, you know, you're giving yourself a lot of opportunities and then, you know, eventually the putts will fall and you'll start getting momentum and then so on and so on. So, um, but then again, you know, it, it can also be the curse sometimes. You kind of have it swirl. You just got to try and figure out what shot, you know, for me, um, that I kind of learned what I can hit just to get it in the fairway and, and, and to be able to put a score up on the board. Yeah, I was going to be my next next question. Is that if you when you're playing, if uh, you're having one of those days, one of those weeks where the the game's not quite on, uh, do you actually dial it back at all? Do you do you change your strategy? Um, usually, I'll just hit it really low. Um, that's kind of a shot I created last year, um, just kind of messing around. But it for me, it goes a lot straighter. Um, you know, since the beginning of the year at Safeway, that's pretty much all I did. Um, it was kind of a tighter course. I knew if I hit driver well, I could push it up. So um, basically, I would just tee down about a half a ball more, and um, I would just you know launch it about a three or four versus you know about a seven. Um, and for me, it's, I feel like it's just a lot more control, and I and I and I know where it's going to go versus you know if I you know try to hit hit up on it and swing hard. Um, you know, it's just it's just a guess sometimes. Yeah, and it's well documented um, the strength of your game being power. But um, for you uh, moving forward, what what area of your game, what areas of your game, uh, are you looking to improve on? Uh, for me, it's just about 150 in. That's all we're focusing on. Um, you know, obviously the driver, like you said, is my big, biggest advantage, and uh, I'm gonna have good weeks and bad weeks with that. That's just how it goes. But you know, for me. I just really need to focus on 150 yards in, you know, with how many opportunities I get myself. And then, you know, getting those crucial up and downs when you need to. And then, you know, making those four and five footers um, when you need to as well. So, um, like I said, right now, those, those that's the only area of my game that I'm really focusing on. We're talking to Cameron Champ. And the, the great exciting news is that Cameron's going to come down and play in the Australian PGA Championship at RACV Royal Pines uh, in December on the Gold Coast. And we're finding out a little bit more about Cameron because, look, I must confess, I, I get obsessed watching you play golf, the, the, the distances that you hit the ball, but it seems so effortless. So I've got a couple of questions. I'm sure you've been asked these before. But when you were a young kid, sort of 10, 12 years of age, 
were you hitting the ball long distances back then as well? Um, I definitely, I definitely started to notice around ten and eleven years old, um, and then obviously you know twelve to fifteen it really sparked. Um, you know, I would say I'm, I've been the same off the tee since I was probably fifteen. Um, it's been roughly the same. I might have gained just a little bit, obviously because I grew into my body and whatnot. But um, I would definitely say it started out um, when I was younger, and obviously when I was younger I had no idea where it was going. <laughs> I would just hit it. And, and go find it, but um, yeah, I, I would definitely say you know it started you know 10, 11, 12 years old. So the, there's a couple of questions from that. And firstly, when you first picked up a golf club, how old were you, and and who taught you, or did you just watch on television and mimic what was happening there? There seems to be some sort of secret recipe for what you can do with the the distances you can hit the ball. Yeah, I mean, I started uh, roughly when I was two, is when I was introduced by my grandfather. Um, he played golf. Um, he was the only golfer in my family, and my dad played um, professional baseball. He played in the minors for the Baltimore Orioles. So um, he was not a golfer, but my grandpa was, and um, I just kind of fell in love with, with the game with him. And um, he's the one that taught me till I was probably, you know, five and six um, years old. And uh, you know, it, it just kind of went from there. You know, I played all all other sports, but. For some reason, with with grandpa, it was just golf, and I just fell in love with it more. Yeah, it's amazing. And so, do you like do you do yoga, or do you do? I mean, what do you do to, um, to be able to have the the flex? I'm I'm trying to get tips here, Cameron. But how do you the the sort of the the flexibility you get, or the the talk that you get through the through the club head speed? It's it's fascinating as to do what you do because it doesn't look like you're swinging really hard. Yeah, I mean it's. It's more of a natural thing. I've I've always been very flexible, almost too flexible in a sense. Um, you know, I I, I wouldn't say I've done yoga. I mean, I just do mainly just um, a lot of core, a lot of you know leg stuff, just to keep you know my back um, safe. Um, you know, I, I kind of had to change my posture a little bit. I was too arched, um, just to protect it a little bit. You know, since I've had back issues in college and whatnot, so. Um, you know, for me, it's just really keeping up with it, you know, with my physio every single week, um, stretching properly, doing the proper workouts, to get warmed up um, every single day. You know, for me, when I, whenever I don't do those things, I always feel like I'm super stiff and I can't turn. Um, you know, so for me, working out and stretching and doing it properly is, is a huge factor for my game. Hey Cameron, now two-time winner on the U.S. Tour. What's uh... – and winning again early in the season, in the roll around season, what, what are your goals, and have they changed now? And is it a you know Ryder Cup? And so tell us about your goals moving forward. No, they haven't changed. I mean, my goals this year were to make the majors, and I've I've done that except one so far. So, um, you know, those were the main goals. And obviously, you know, with my grandpa's situation, my only goal really to start the year was to make it to Augusta, um, and so hopefully he, he can make it. So obviously, you know, I made that. Um, but you know, we'll have to see, um, you know, how he, how he, how he holds up and whatnot. So, um, you know, I I still have my, you know, normal statistical goals, um, you know, green hit, off the tee, total, um, and stuff like that. But, um, you know, for me, you know, my main goal was what's going on my family. I, I, I did that, you know, obviously at Safeway and, um, that was the most satisfying moment for me for sure. Like I said. Now, before we let you go, go, coming back to to going to the Gold Coast, do you know much about? Don't worry about the golf, but do you know much about the Gold Coast and where you're actually heading? Because it's one of the more spectacular places to visit in all of Australia. Well, I mean, I've I've heard uh, a bunch of things about it. You know, we're going to have some plan some things out and come a little early and, and go sightsee and do some stuff. But um, like I said, it, it's just from what I've what I've heard from other people. And so, for, and what about from an Australian perspective? Are there many Australians that you've become uh, friends with on tour, whether it be from the secondary tour or the main tour? Um, you know, I, I played with Cameron Smith. Well, both of them. Um, and I played with. Um, well, I, I don't know how you pick which Cameron Smith, but uh, Cameron Smith. I was on the Web. dot com last year. Um, me and him played a little bit, and then obviously, you know, Cameron Smith has been on the tour for quite a few years. Um, you know, we play at the players, um, and then a few practice rounds. So, um, as far as on um, since I've turned pro, you know, those those are the two main guys. And obviously, Adam 
you know, I've had a dinner with him, um, with the Rolex guys. He's a super nice guy. Um, loves his watches, which is awesome. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, definitely looking forward to getting down there. So first time in Australia, that's going to be really exciting. Look, we're, we're really yeah. wrapped that you're coming down. As I said, you're one of the most exciting young players in the world and, uh, the best is still to come, and we're looking forward to seeing you uh, in person in December for the Australian PGA Championship. Thank you for having a chat to us, and we wish you all the best in the lead-up to our great event. No, thank you very much. I really appreciate you all having me on today. So that was Cameron Champ joining us there from the States, and uh, again, just repeating the news, he's signed up. He's going to be one of the key players in the PGA Championship, the Australian PGA Championship on the Gold Coast from the 19th to the 22nd of December. The field is starting to assemble and it looks really quite strong. We've talked a lot about the Australian Open, but the PGA Championship, which has had strong fields in, in recent years. In fact, you know, for the last 10 or so years, it's been a really good field, particularly linking with the European Tour as well. There's a lot to play for. Well, we've had some, uh, we've had some good Americans come out and that have done well. Van, uh, yep. Van Mm. Uh, the third, the third, one. Mm-hmm. Yep. Ricky Fowler was in the l- yeah. last group. Comes yep. Sunday. Yep. So, and this is a course I think it will suit Cameron Champ's game. There's a number of holes that the further you hit it, the better off it kind of <laughs> opens up well, yeah. and well, it becomes be more him. forgiving. So, yeah. there's probably no more uh, a man that's going to benefit more than that from than, than Champ. So it's uh, should be interesting. And, and then how you deal with uh, grain in the in the greens because they laid the turf, so the grains like apparently goes through four different it ways on a 20, 20 foot putt, but it's something that Cameron would have dealt with a lot um, in you know the, in, down in Florida and that part of the world. So Dale, when Cameron says that he at 15 was hitting the ball well and truly over 300 metres, yeah. as someone that has gone through and seen so many people play golf, wh- how do you react to that? Uh, shock. <laughs> at 15 years of age, that's quite it. That's that's just amazing. So, um, yeah, I haven't seen anything. Anything. Have, you, have you seen him swing it? Like it was like there was something on uh, Instagram and Twitter a few months ago of him as a, I think he was a 12, 14 year old. No, I didn't see that. And no. it, was, it was yeah, it was incredible. No, the lag he was cr- like yeah. creating then and stuff was just like this is. Yeah, and it's it's an interesting one too. Is that that there are people just that just know how to generate power. You know, it's not it's. They they just do it naturally. I guess it's like some of that jumps high and runs quick, that sort of stuff. But genetics help too. Yeah, there's no question. And, and again, mm. baseball. His dad's a professional baseballer, so you've got those that that sort of gene pool as well. But it is interesting. There are, as I said, there are people that just can actually generate just more speed. Um, they figure a way of actually just maximising the the muscles they have in their body. You know. So I mean, this is opens up a, a really interesting discussion around power and around mm-hmm. whether you've just got it naturally or whether you can be coached it. So. When you get, and I think this is this is relative to someone that might have a handicap of sixteen or six or, or whatever the case may be, or a professional, that when a player comes to you, do you work with what he's essentially got from a, a natural swing point of view, or do you go, oh look, there's a bit to like here, but we've got to completely reconstruct it? How do you go about that? Well, it depend, depends one on the player, depends what the goals are. Um, so if you might get if if it's a, a, so someone that's playing, but club golf and they're you know 16 handicapper and they'd like to get down to 10 or whatever so you'll work obviously a lot within what they have and um just to modify some things to change the ball flight around straighten the ball flight out create some more consistency and then obviously work on that's going to create distance anyway yeah correct yeah. and that's always going to create distance but it's just really a matter of just modifying to a degree what they have but someone comes in you know another story and says look you know i'm you know i'm playing off um you know 24 i want to get my handicap down to single figures you know i've got you know time off work now i'm really dedicated to it yada 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 well, that that could be a total reconstruct and again you you work hand in hand with that person and just find out exactly what it is they want to do how much time they have to practice so in that state you you're actually working on their mechanics to change it but you're also working on their practice routines and practice programs as well so as they maximize what they're doing so you're always you're always coaching based on what an individual's goals are yeah you know? and, and, so, and people come to you and they say look i just want to be more consistent they're not even worried about handicap it's just like i just want to be more consistent so you, you just make some modifications to what they have to simplify it and, and generally too the, the the thing with golf is that the, the correct movement of golf is actually way more natural and way more comfortable than the incorrect one so once a person makes that change and trusts that change they will actually feel a lot more comfortable with with that motion yeah, yeah. that makes perfect what about I'll, I'll kind of it's along those lines rephrase it so if 
say in the, uh, this chase for distance. So if someone said came to you and say, "I want to, I want to hit it further. I need to say, say yeah. they're a scratch goal for a tour player, someone like Zach Johnson or Brian Gay. What would, what would your, what would you be your first steps? Well, in, in, t- in that in that circumstance, if, they're, if they've got an established pattern like that and they've played golf in that matter, you're not going to be giving them. They're not going to. They're not going to be a situation when they generate that much more speed. I mean, you could make their swing. There might be elements of their swing you think is a little bit deficient. You can improve it. They may get, you know, some increase in distance. But for them, it's not going to be significant. It's not going to be that you know, like you know, fifty yard pop that they're probably probably looking for. So again, it's, it's you're doing it based on. But- yeah, what and what about like my argument would be. Say for a young kid that wants to, who hits it well, anyways. Well, do you work out like what you? Well, again, that so so yeah. what you do there is you've got, and I could use say Ryan for example, right? Yeah. So my son, so Ryan was very tiny yeah. and lacked power, so he just he just hit the gym and he he hit the gym doing things that, that some people would think that you don't want to be doing those that, those sort of weight exercises, but for him it made a massive difference. I mean, he went from he he went from you know really short hitter to you know like. R- Above average sneak, in terms yeah, of sneaky, yeah, sneaky long. long, he can actually get it out there. So, so in that in that circumstance, you just look at the individual person. So, so someone like a Cameron Champ, for example. What? So for him, he hits it that far. Well, his his entire workout program for him should be for longevity in his career. Yeah, right. To protect Which he kind his of body. Talked about yeah, because of his core and mm, yeah, had lower that, back issues in, in college. And that 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 thing gets on a really good topic. That's then you look at the Tiger Woods example. Now you look at Tiger. So he gets on tour. And again, we spoke on this the previous podcast, but the equipment that he was brought up with wasn't the equipment these kids are brought up with. So he couldn't. Mm. He, he would have been longer if he was brought up yeah. with the same equipment that these kids are brought up with now, right? So, but if you look at Tiger, is that he he turned up on tour the longest hitter on tour, right? Skinny kid, yada yada yada. Now he hit he hit the gym and went for the you know the muscles and yada yada yada. But the re- the reality is, if you look back on it, the thing that let Tiger down the most is his body. Yeah, his body continually broke down. How many operations he had, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, again, if you look at that in hindsight, so when, when Tiger Woods turned up on tour, if you're the longest hitter on tour, why are you working on beach muscles? It's mm. like you don't need the extra power. You actually need you need to look at your body in terms of longevity. So as you look after your body, so as you it's it's and more and injury and prevention. He went he went extreme as work, he does. like Navy Seal kind of yeah. stupid yeah. stuff that made him vulnerable to severe injury. So too, when so, yeah. when you see a Cameron Champ do what he's done, and there are other examples of pretty small guys that can hit the ball yeah, long absolutely. distances, has it has it changed the way you've not sort of defy logic, but has it changed the way you see a golf swing as a coach that, oh, I can actually, you can do different ways or you, you can do it differently to, to get that distance or is it still the same fundamentals? The, the fundamentals are the same. It's so the more efficient the swing is, the more power you can apply. So the less compensation you're making, the more that everything is generating its energy into the ball. So therefore, no, the actual teaching component hasn't changed. You're trying to make some, uh, someone have a, a better goal swing, a more mm-hmm. efficient motion. They can generate the power. The equipment change is the thing that you can now hit it as hard as you want. I said, whereas previously you couldn't because the ball spun a lot more, the heads yep. were smaller. So it was you would you would teach the same motion, but it was about that person being able to control the spin on the ball. So I guess if you think about it, it's probably almost as much about the way you go about your practice and your game. So as a young player, is it um, you would work a lot on controlling the spin and being able to move the ball in different ways and you know dial back your distance a bit. Why I asked that sort of question of um, mm. uh, earlier on. Yeah, Whereas, we, talk, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, like Oak Jeff's game. That's correct. How, that's how we used to play golf. Absolutely, yeah. You would play golf like Jeff Ogilvy played. So and, and now you they're playing golf like Cameron Champ. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and if Jeff if Jeff had been brought up in the era of, of current equipment, then he would have just smashed it a long way because yeah. he's a great athlete. Mm. Right? But but back then distance no one even spoke about distance back then because it mm. wasn't a component of the of the game. You didn't have that the gap now well, like well, he, what was it a, it wasn't a component because it was harder to achieve because well, of we, the because of the spin, the extra yeah. spin on the ball. So the harder hit it the more it spun. Yeah. So what happens you would have guys that were longer, but it was was all relative, you know. Whereas now you, you go on tour now and there's got there's like you walk down there's like 40, 50 yard forty fifty meters difference between guys hitting how far they the golf ball. It's yeah. like there's you get the average, you get long, and then you get and then you get this ridiculous mm. super long stuff, which is just which is now like you know twenty 
15, 20 guys doing it. Correct. Whereas before, you, you, you'd have like two or three out there doing it. But, and, it's, and it's just going to keep growing, you know, and, yep. you know, unless and what they do with the courses becomes, that's a whole new topic. Of what's yeah. Yeah. And the interesting thing out of all of that is that Nicholas Colsarts, who is one of the longer hitters in the world, won on the European Tour overnight. And it was all won because he found a way to get the ball in the hole. It wasn't how far he was hitting the ball. that He missed some really short parts on the front nine. It looked like it was all going to unravel, but he found a way to get it in the hole. Yeah. So you, you can hit it as far as you like. You've still got to find a way to maximise and capitalise on that distance. Correct. And BJ brought up before, is that there are courses as well that really do suit longer mm. hitters more mm. than others. You know, when you, you brought up the, the PJ at the pond. And I would say the Australian, for example. Yeah. Right? Now, the Australian's that way because it's, it's bunkered on both sides. So... There's not a lot of rough. Yeah, correct. So it's bunkered on both sides. So that's that's really... So everyone's you know hits it between the bunkers. But if you're long enough to actually carry the bunkers, then it's like there's a football oval mm. here too. So those type of courses really... Um, if you can hit it, that's a massive head start for you. There's probably half a dozen holes that you, you hit into a much bigger area than the rest of the field. So in over four rounds, it's you know it's more than more than eight and holes. So, and that's where we had a good discussion the other month with Jeff and a few others talking about these guys nowadays, the Gen Z guys that smash it so far. He goes, they might they might win two or three times a year, and they kind of pick their courses where they can just smash it. But then they might go missing for the rest. But they're going to win two or three times, and rest takes care of itself. rest. Kind of yeah. takes care of itself. You know, I don't think. You'll find these, and it's harder too these days because um, the talent pool's so big, but it's harder to be, just compete every week like consistently well because someone will bob up and and just have a week out with whatever part of the game it is or whatever. But I think that's just the Gen Z are happy with that. Oh, yeah, I'll win twice twice a year and mm-hmm. whatever. My, I miss 10 other cuts. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, uh, just target particular just, tournaments. Yeah. All right, we'll take a break. Uh, after this, uh, really looking forward to catching out with Michael Sim. We talked about it earlier. He won the WA uh, Open over the weekend, and he's been a man that's been in the wilderness for quite some time. This is, He's kind of been uh, knocking on the door that this might have been about to happen. Well, it did for him yesterday, and he'll join us next. Future Golf gets you playing at amazing courses. Future Golf gets you an official golf handicap. Future Golf is the future of golf. It makes you part of Australia's greatest golf community, playing free rounds at partner courses, enjoying lessons, awesome golf events, mini golf and ex-golf. Whether you're a beginner or a golf addict, Future Golf lets you get into the game your way, all from as little as $24.95 a month. And because you're listening to this show, the PGA Golf Club, you'll save 10% on your membership. Just enter the code PGA Podcast as one word when you register. Got that code? PGA Podcast. Head to futuregolf.com.au slash join. Future Golf, play your way. Well, it was a big win to Michael Sim over the weekend in the WA Open. It's great to see Michael Sim back at the top of the leaderboard. And uh, he joins us this morning and he's had a pretty busy time of it since winning only yesterday. Michael, thanks very much for your time. Thanks for having me on the show. Now, before we get into the golf, explain exactly what you've done since pretty much you walked off the 18th yesterday. Yeah, I walked off 18 yesterday and I had a few beers uh, with my caddy and and my uh, parents and some friends. and Yeah, took the red-eye home last night that left about 11 o'clock and got into Brisbane and took the uh, train just down to the Gold Coast and just to take my boys swimming. So, quite a busy night. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So... Um, BJ and Dale will have plenty of questions for you, but I, I just want to know, how are you feeling this morning? Is it excitement? Is it relief? I mean, it was a, a tremendous final nine holes to get the job done, but um, I imagine you'd be pretty excited this morning. Yeah, obviously growing up in WA, that's where I, you know, I played all my junior golf and on the golf, and uh, they obviously helped me throughout my career. So I always wanted to win the WA Open, and uh, I just that off the list of kind of players. Uh, yeah, great feeling yesterday. Hayden pushed me the whole way. Uh, even Buckle Wright, I think he was up to sort of 13 under as well. So coming down the last couple of holes, I really didn't know exactly where I was until uh, my caddy uh, spoke to a friend of mine and said he was too short to lead. So, um, and then for Hayden to hold that 40 foot putt was a bit unexpected. So I had to make my four foot putt for the win. So it was, uh, yeah, he pushed me the whole way. And, you know, he's a, he's a talented player at 17. and He's got a huge future ahead. Before BJ and Dale ask you questions, I'm just interested in your sort of journey over the last couple of years particularly. Um, I've noticed your name 
up on leaderboards a lot more in recent times. But for those that love their golf and remember Michael Sim from a decade ago, tell us a little bit about what it's been like over the last couple of years, but even further back than that. Yeah, I was thinking about this morning. I think I've only played maybe 10 events since I won the World Tour and the Queensland Open, so not too many. And that was November 17. So, uh, yeah, I've just been, I've actually been doing my bridging program this year, so I've been looking at getting into maybe some coaching next year or maybe a head play in the future. So, obviously, with some limited goals in Australia, uh, it's been hard to sort of get the income coming through. So, just been looking at different avenues moving forward, but uh, obviously with a win yesterday, it's uh, given me a lot of hope. And I'm actually going to Japan Q School, and probably you know, it's about three or four weeks' time. So that'll be my third go up there. So hopefully this, this time will be a lucky year, and I can get a Japanese tour card to uh, 2020. Yeah, Simi, uh, what about the form? So is, is, is this win? I know you played all right last week, but over over like a longer period of time, was this was this win? Were you contending kind of always happening? You've been in form, or how has the form been? Uh, I've been playing. Uh, there's been a few programs uh, sort of leading up to uh, the last, uh, the past two WA events, and I played not too bad at home after the first round. So I've been I've been playing really well, and I've been playing some sort of money matches at home on the Gold Coast. So my form leading in was, was good, but obviously it's, on, it's different playing tournament golf, and you know, I was happy to just get out there and just play and I never really I never really think I thought I was gonna win yesterday but obviously getting into contention and you know, just sort of got in a bit of a zone there on the back nine and just really happy to get over the line. And what about the future? So your Japan tour school in a couple of weeks, but what about like say longer term goals? Where where do you want to eventually end up or do you want to play Go back to playing full time. What's what's the the main? Yeah, thing? I don't. Well, I don't, certainly don't want to give up playing. I obviously love playing the game, and it's just more so the opportunity. I think you need to be playing twenty twenty five events a year. And I think last year I might have played five, and this year I've played four. Or so it's uh, it's pretty slim playing wise. But yeah, I love playing. I love competing. So I'd love to play up in Japan. I think it'd be great for our family. Uh, with the tour starting in May, finishing in November. So you still play as a big Aussie tour event like Vic Open and Aussie Open. You still get all those. So that would be the plan uh, moving forward. So hopefully, like I said, I can go up to Japan and play well at Q-School and get one of those cards. Uh, Simi Lynch here, mate. Um, with, so with with your journey, I mean, you, you've played golf absolutely at the, at the highest level. Um, um and now you've you've just had a win in uh, in your home state. How how close do you feel your game is now uh, to what it was when you were playing at your peak? Yeah, it's a great question. I think for me, it's all about the drive and the putter. Uh, if I drive the ball straight, which I, I felt like I did in Calgary, and uh, I putted obviously quite well there too. I think that's probably the biggest part of my game. I feel like if one of those two go off, more so the driver, I feel like. It's, start missing a few fairways, that's probably where we start to struggle, but um, in back, of, back in 2009, I think I, I led the tour in driving, overall driving, so I don't feel like I'm too far off Yeah, where I am now. Um, yeah, like I said, I drove the ball great last week, and that just gives me a lot of, lot of opportunities from the fairway, so other than not playing, you know, 20, 25 games, I don't feel like I'm really that far away. Yeah, right. So, and for people listening in, Simi, as said, you, you've played PGA Tour, you've played at the highest level, uh, you've played majors, and you've been sort of honing your skills now, getting your game back on track on the on the Australasian Tour, a lot of T2 events. Could you, you give give people uh, an insight in terms of the quality of play um, in the events in Australia? I think I think that's very strong. I mean, you, you, this, I think next week down in, uh, or this coming week down in Vic PGA, I had a look at the entry list. I think there's four Tier 1 winners, and, you know, Tier 1, that's Australian Opens, uh, New South Wales Opens, PGA, so that's a strong field. I think Nick O'Hearn is down, down there too, so even though the money's not there, the fields are, I think, are very strong. Like, you, you've got to go out and shoot, you know, 15 or 20 under most weeks to win a golf tournament, so it's always going to be pretty top-heavy. Uh, I think the web.com, when you look at those the tournaments over there, I think it's bit more bunch. I think there's a lot more guys that can win, but uh, it's definitely a, a really good, strong, 
quality of golf is coming out of the, of the throne. And, and like you said, those tier two events, I and mean, even that the kid I played with yesterday is 17 years old, and you know he pushed me the whole way. So it's definitely encouraging for Australian golf and WA golf moving forward. We've seen it before with uh, golfers and even tennis players that they they lose their status, uh, they have a long term injury, and they have to come back and play in tennis satellites and play in front of no people with no um, prize money just to get themselves back at, with a chance of potentially getting towards the top. You've gone through a similar thing in golf. How how do you find the motivation levels? You know, having to do what you're doing now compared to where you were ten years ago, Michael. Yeah, I mean, I, like you said, I've played at the highest level and, you know, I had stress function was fine. I had a shoulder injury that kept me out of the masses and I lost form there in 2011 and New Zealand and saw down for a lesson there at one point. I just wasn't really in the right headspace. And, yeah, I mean, I think golf, it's, when you think you're done, it always kind of opens another door for you. Uh, it's probably what it's done the last couple of years for me. It's still something I can still play and, like I said, I really, I'd really want to keep playing this game. I love playing. I love competing, and uh, hopefully Japan can open those doors for me and you know get get back on the world stage and uh, get right up there in the world rankings again, like I did in 20, 2009, 2010. Were there times where you hated the game? Because I'm, I'm thinking, you know, you'd be walking down the fairway and thinking, you know, five, six years ago, I could do this. I could do this. I can't do it anymore. This game's no good. I hate it. I want to give it up. Did you? Ever have those those thoughts when you knew what you could do compared to what you were unable to do there for a while? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, probably 2011, like as I said, coming off in, his injuries and loss of form. Uh, yeah, I, I did. I hated the game. I, I didn't really know what I was doing technically. Uh, mentally, I probably wasn't a good spot. I was living in America. My family wasn't there. I didn't have a partner. And, uh, my coach was back home. and I just started searching. And then, yeah, I stopped playing golf for probably... Most of 2013, I didn't really, I didn't play a tournament. Uh, I was living in Perth and just sort of hanging out. And um, yeah, the, you know, I've got, got my wife now and boy, and I just feel like I've got a really good balance in life at the moment. Uh, and that's probably a reason for my success and motivation to try and get back playing again. So when you sort of look back and think of, you know, being the final group at a, at a US Open and, and, the amount of expectation that was on you there for a while, you know, 10 years back. Do you think now looking forward that your best is still in front of you as a golfer? Uh, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I obviously, obviously peaked at a very young age, had a good amateur career. And, and like you said, I got off to a great start in my early pro days. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about peaking. Uh, obviously, I'm not. My goal is not really to sort of get to the PJ Tour at the moment. Uh, I'd love to just play up in Japan and get that life balance going and have a good career up there. And if I can do that, then maybe look to the States and go and get back there and maybe, you know, five or six years. At the moment, I'm not really looking at playing over there. I'd really just like to, you know, obviously playing Japan would be awesome. You know, there's a lot of guys, a lot of Australians up there that can uh, play and make a good living up there and really enjoy the golf. So that's kind of where my mind is at the moment and, and long term. Have your goals kind of changed now that you kind of got a win and kind of early in the summer to, and, and moving forward now? What are, what are your goals for the rest of the Australian summer? Yeah, well, I'm playing uh, the Vic PGA this week and then I'll actually, I'm going to miss Gibbs playing six due to third stage of Japan and then I'm going to miss the Australian Open too. So uh, it was, I feel like how cool he was, a big week for me this, with the events I'm going to miss coming up due to Q school. So that's, uh, that's put me up to about 35th on the money list. So it should should be right to keep my card with, with limited events coming up. Uh, obviously, the win at the WA Open doesn't count towards the money list on the tour. So, um, yeah, it's obviously I'm looking forward to playing the PGA here at Royal Pines. That's just 10 minutes from home. I've played a bit of golf there lately, so I've got... <laughs> you don't like, play well there, apparently. <laughs> yeah. I, need, I think I need to go out there every day. It's definitely a course I struggle on. Uh, the raised greens and the and how undulating they are. And it's, uh, I, it's, a, it's a tricky course. That design. Well, Michael, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, in all seriousness, it's so good to see you have another win um, when you're playing at your best, it's it's so good to watch. Hopefully, it's the start of many more good things to come. And uh, good luck getting uh, that card into Japan. 
No worries. Thanks, Adam. Thank you to Michael Sim. Now, you've got a story, BJ, about Michael Sim. I must confess, he was one of my favourite players when he was coming through. It was like he was going to well, be remember the, day, the next Adam Scott. Well, the last group with Tiger. Yep. Beth Page Black, yep, US Open. It was incredible. We, we could have talked to him for so much longer, but uh, we didn't have time. But you have got a story yeah, you so, want to Yeah, um, so the year Sergio came out for the uh, Australian Masters of Victoria. So I played in a pro-am. This is a good story. I'll try and cut it short. Um, it's a long story. You pumped it uh, up. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very good. Uh and Let us be playing the, the pro-am, the Pedro O'Malley, Shane Warne, dropping names. And Sergio was on the same tee. He was on the first or on the 10th. So Warney comes over. He says, come meet Sergio. So I ran over with Warney. Sergio, how you going, buddy? So, and they'd caught up early in the week doing promo stuff. So he's like, oh, Sergio, you know, let's organize poker. So this is the Wednesday. So we organized poker for the Thursday night. And it came famous later on because the paper had found out that Sergio had been playing poker till all hours of the morning, like on the Friday, whatever. So... Sergio, Thursday night, played poker with us, stayed out late, shot like 74 or something. Um, Thursday, uh, Friday night, played poker with us. He shot like 64 on the Friday or something to make the cut easily. Like they reckon it was a ball striking clinic. It was oh, blowing up like 40k actually, northerly, like um, just out of this world. Yeah, I watched that. Uh, Did you? Uh, so then Friday night, um, we played poker again. Um, and Simi had missed the cut. A few of the boys are out. Late that night, Simi calls me. He goes, what are you doing? He was like, I'm, I'm playing poker with you know, Warney and Sergio and a few of the boys. He's like, oh, do you reckon I could come? I'm just about to leave this venue. This is this is late too. So I said, yeah, look, I'll ask Warney and make sure it's all right with Sergio because he was a guest. Um, and mind you, uh, Tiger was next to us in, in the room at Crown too, just playing. Uh, so we asked him if he wanted to play and he's uh, Steinberg politely declined and said he's happy playing blackjack by himself, blah, blah, blah. Um, anyway, so yeah, I said, Simmy, yeah, it's all good. Come, come. So Simmy comes and he walks in and he's like, <laughs> he's, he's, like he's blind. Like, so Simmy sits down, buys in, it, everything's going nicely. And then Simmy gets his bad beat, one of Warney's mates. Um, so Simmy starts cracking it and I'm like, oh, hey, calm down, mate. <laughs> like, you don't even know this bloke. We're all joking. It's all jovial. It's all jovial. It's all good. So we all get up to leave. We finished, whatever. And it's real late. Like, I won't mention the time when I'll throw Sergio out of the bus. And um, we get in the lift. And by this stage, Simi had like, he's another five or six drinks deep. He's drink, drinking like double shot, you know, blue label Johnny Walker. Like it was crazy <laughs> stuff. And then um, we get in the lift and it's just me, Sergio, um, Simi and Warney. And um, Sergio looks, he's chatting away. He's like, oh, Sergio, he goes, I've, been, I've been watching your putt lately. He's like, he's like mate, he, it's hard. To, this is obviously a podcast. But he stands there and he goes, mate, this, no. And he walks in up in behind him and taps him on the lats. And you might be able to explain this. Simmy's big on punting with your lats. So he's like, this taps him on the lats. He's like, yes. And Sergio's looking at him. He's like, man. What? He goes, yeah, mate, you got to putt with your lats. And he's standing behind Sergio, like tapping him on the lats. And Sergio doesn't really know who Simmy is, but I explained earlier that he played with Tyree. Like, he goes, yeah, I don't know who he is. but. And then so he stands over the top beside him. He goes, like, Sergio, this, no. And then walks, this, Yes. And then we're, I'm just like losing my mind, pissing myself <laughs> laughing. And Sergio's like, yeah, yeah, thanks, Michael, thanks. And luckily the, the, the lift just binged and it was on Sergio's floor. So he's like, yeah, I'll see, see you later, boys, and got out. And then <laughs> so I'm in hysterics. And Sergio was like in shock. And he's just like, who is this bloke? Like a bit, little bit filthy. Like he's this guy giving me a putting lesson at all hours in the morning when he's had <laughs> And so, Simi could hardly remember the next day, but it was a great story. Uh, Sergio didn't go on to win, unfortunately, but um, uh, Simi thought he was responsible for uh, Sergio's kind of good putting display that he put on that week, but it was hilarious. Sergio was kind of in shock and a bit offended that who's this bloke giving me a putting lesson in a lift late at night. It was very funny. That was, the, was that the Masters when Tiger went on a tear on the back nine on the final day and just fell short? Or and Stuart Appleby won, I think? Maybe you might know more, is it? I yeah, I reckon that was the one. Because yeah, Luke Donald came out for it was that pretty one sure it was well. a Victoria. Well, yeah, yeah, it was a Vic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Luke Donald. Is that the one, the Stuart, the Stuart one? No, yeah, it was. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Stuart won? Stuart won at Victoria. He, he did, won, yeah. won at Vic. Well, yeah. Daniel Gorn had the lead there. Yeah, he did. He did. Yeah. He did. But it was. I just remember Tiger wasn't really in calculations and then went on this amazing run. And you could just... I was following Stuart and you could just hear the roars that were sort of six, seven holes in front. And everyone, we well, could see, and they all just started to get nervous because Tiger was going to post Lurking. a number, yeah. and it was, uh, and that was, I mean, that 
doesn't seem that long ago, but that was. That is a long time. It probably was a long time ago when we, you know, there, it was we did a, have when, the when masters was that? and. Oh, no. Google anyway. search. Well, yeah. well I'll, I'll actually Google it to find the year, but I wanted 10, to ask 11? you about. We'll find out. We'll find out. Michael Sim. Now, you've gone through this a little bit with Aaron Baddeley, someone that was a bit of a, not a child prodigy, but close to it, getting um, doing really well early, but then just pushing and pushing and pushing and then sort of losing what you had. How how difficult is that, especially with young people that have high expectations and you know enormous ambition? Yeah, well, look, it's extremely difficult. And Aaron's circumstances was different than, than Michael's. Michael was brought about initially through... Um, through injury, mm-hmm. um, so he it, it's injury. Then sometimes that injury can affect the golf swing as well. Uh, then obviously confidence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a lot, there's a lot that goes on, and and then you'll find you've, that's sort of why I asked the question about where he, how he feels his game is now in in comparison. Because then you've got, as BJ would understand, you, then you've got that mental the mental side of it, like. When you're young and successful, it's like you just feel like you're indestructible. Um, and then you have that down period, so the confidence drops, right? So often often you get a situation where you get somewhat the physical part of it back, so the game feels good. But yep. mentally, there's just some demons sitting in there. There's not the same drive, the ambition, and certainly not the same belief. So often that's the difficult thing. That's a difficult thing to get up. And that's if you're playing a team sport, we have got so many teammates around you that can support you and lift you and yada yada. That's quite different than the than the individual sport because you are on your own, mm. right? You have a caddy on the golf course, you're out there for five hours, blah blah blah. But you are absolutely on your own. So, yeah, in that that aspect, there's that that mental side of it that and the the lost confidence, the lost belief. Um, some some get it back, um, others don't. The Aaron one was was different. Um, Aaron was we, we were sort of fortunate, super talented, incredibly dedicated. Um, so he he went from basically picking up a golf club at twelve and then winning an Australian Open at eighteen. So in six years, went from beginner to and his to work with him. He was he was an unbel- He was like this unbelievable student to work with. It was just like give him give him a task. He'd go work on it, come back. He'd done it. Give him a task, come back, done it. And he just like and you could just build his swing just step by step by step. For everything putting, short game, blah blah blah. But then for him is it what happened some of the things that changed there is that winning that Australian Open all of a sudden it changes there's now you're not in your own bubble you know you, you're a point where you just he was incredibly goal orientated right and so you're in your own bubble just working away doing what what you think you needed to do then all of a sudden then you're on the world stage you know so that your life then you're in a fishbowl so you, now you've got all this external pressure coming in external pressure um did, did he did with it with respect to him you can answer it but did he think that the grass was greener when like going to the states and changing coaches and you think that this is going to make me better yeah uh, yes for sure and but again that uh, my sense of that is that you get now you have this external influence right not to mention that yes now it's mm. so there's this and those people are in are in your ears right and they're telling you what you should be doing so so Loss of form, loss of confidence. Now all these people say, oh, you need to change, you change, your, change your coach, blah, 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 blah. So all of a sudden, so now this, as I said, you, you, that, now you get off that, you get off that track. You get off the absolute track that you were, you were on. And then, and then same thing. So then, you know, way, way, way down the track. And then to try and actually rebuild where it was and what it was. Um, and you've had all that interference along the way that, 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 that from a coaching, I guess probably that would be a longer, mm. longer discussion. But to try and rebuild back when you've had all that inf- interference along the way is it, is quite quite challenging. It, yeah. it, it feels that it's more a mental thing than a physical thing often because it's something that just triggered in my mind when you talked about that being young and being invincible. That the and I'm not going to name names, but there are plenty of examples of young golfers that d- did extremely well from the age of, say, 17 through to 21, that they felt invincible because they knew how to win. But then all of a sudden when they forgot how to win and they uh, and all of a sudden that confidence that you take to the golf course goes, that it, that's almost harder to, to get going again than the actual mechanics of a golf swing sometimes. Uh, interesting. And I would. that's why the semi 
conversation with Aaron is, is an interesting one because I would say that Aaron has never lost that mental side. Yes. Right? In terms yeah, of... Yeah, absolutely. It, because if once he gets in contention, if his game's on, he, yeah, can, absolutely. He, he, can, he, can, he can hit the line. Whereas I'd say that it knows to me a little bit... I was not as intimate as no Aaron, but I would say that the Simi story now is more. That's more that mental, mm. that mental side. It was into like BJ asked the questions about you know what your goals are, and probably weren't that they weren't that definitive to mm. me. It was like okay, if I can get to Japan, and you know that's good life. He's almost not trying to, trying to get too ahead of himself. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, it probably was quite. It, that would have been that conversation with with Simi at. 22 you ask him what are your goals that would have been mm. absolutely this is it you know this is where i'm heading is what i'm doing but of course you've got you know he's, he's now got a family and so yeah so know, he's, he's, he's that, kind of his priorities have changed you know so it's like, yeah so if you're when when you're at that age it's a bit like bj's lifestyle now we just want to he can just play golf every day <laughs> you know so it's like that's all you do you get up you organize your life you play golf you play golf every day and, and that's what you do and this is this is where you're heading but all of a sudden now you said you got the wife the yeah. kids and blah 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 so it does there's lots of things that change the, i'm sure that people that are listening to this you can all relate to this because it it might be a michael sim situation but it might be your own situation listening where your handicap might have been five or six and now it's out to 14 and you can't recapture it you can't get it back to where it was and that great frustration you have where at times where you want to throw the game away because you can't get where you were. It might have only been three years ago and you're racking your brains trying to work out, well, how did I get to that place? What am, you know, I'm trying harder now and I, well, that's I can't it, get where I was. That's why it's so luring, the game. Absolutely. Yeah, it's and the, it's all relative. This, through the, this ever search for whatever it is for yeah. you to get from 10 to 5 or you gone out to 12 and want to get back to 5 is this, for, this search for... And then improvement and because it's so hard it's this, this like yeah. this carrot that's always dangled in front of you and it's like well, I was just saying to Lynch before like I just I thought I fa- I think I found something on the Thursday when I was hitting balls so I didn't Friday, Saturday, Sunday I hadn't hit balls so, but all I wanted to do was just go and hit balls because I think I found something Yeah. and I think this is going to solve the issue this is this is the big thing like <laughs> I've the, done it I'm going I'm to be on the tour soon yeah. and not really but well, I you think, know I I'm, I'm going to be playing the ball <laughs> goal from hitting the ball like I've always wanted to I think I found it yeah it's like there's ever this and then and then there's the one where your mate who you always had covered all of a sudden gets his handicap to a point that you think <laughs> oh this is getting a bit low for my liking no. and then you start there's, pushing there's not, it. Too, there's not too many of those. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well talking about uh, golf coaching we're going to take a break here because uh, Craig Spence he joins us every week and uh, I wonder what he's going to talk to about uh, this week we'll do that next on the PGA Golf Club Everything you want to know about Aussie golf is in one place. PGA.org.au. This is the official site of the PGA of Australia. It's the one website loaded with all the tournament, course and player news. That includes the latest on the ISPS Handa PGA Tour of Australasia. The Find a PGA Pro directory will track down the pros near you. And here's where you can live stream golf's best on PGA TV. Watching tournaments live, streaming replays or watching the latest reports on Aussie golfers around the world. There are even video tips from the pros. So if golf's your game, this is your site. pga.org.au From the Professional Golfers Association of Australia. Driving Australian golf since 1911. And welcome back to the PGA Golf Club. Adam White, Brendan Goddard and Dale Lynch with you this week. Well, it's time to bring in Craig Spence now from the Albert Park uh, Driving Range who has got uh, his uh, tip of the week. Craig, uh, hello and welcome again. G'day, Adam. G'day, Lindsay. BJ, how are we all? Good, Spencey. Great. Good on your spot. Good night. Now, this week you're going to go for a bit more of an, an inventive type of uh, shot, whether it be off the tee, but even uh, on the fairway. Yes. Uh, I know this is a favourite of Lynchy's shots. Um, <laughs> this is the, the punch shot, the knockdown shot, or now referred to as the stinger, that I think... Um, the reason I picked this one, Adam, is that I happened to come across it on Twitter this week. So it was Rob Williams from Twitter account I spotted it on at Getty two three one nine. But um, I think I think you guys might retweet it later, so everyone can have a look at it. But I reckon the punch shot is—is is this the one at the U.S. Open? Yes. Did yeah. You how good? How good is that? Well, it's great footage because it's on the tenth at Pebble Beach. Pebble Beach. You've got the Beautiful big cypress trees behind, so the ball does not get above the height of the cypress trees, and you can see it the whole low. flight too. Like, yeah, yeah, which um, you know, it's it's a golf shot that is 
very the, the quality of the way Gill hits it is obviously not something the average punter can do necessarily, or myself these days for that. Mm-hmm. But um, it is a shot you can you can start to learn through a few tips that I'm about to give you. So you're ready to go? Yep. Let's uh, let's play. So this is just the audio version, but we'll uh, retweet it both uh, through the PJ account and also the RSN 927 account. Um, of uh, Gil Morgan uh, in action at uh, Pebble Beach just, in the USA. Just on that shot too, Spent. I'll explain to the listeners that the tenth haven't previously just been there this year. Oh, of course, you but have. the tenth at Pebble, that's a on a left to right slope. That shot into a little yep. gap of the green where there's just dead right is dead. So generally, yep. that's where the ball wants to go after left to right slope, and he's hit this. So the difficulty of that shot with the wind, slope, and everything that could go wrong. It's, yep. a, it's an unbelievable golf shot. All right, well, you've said that beautifully. Here it is. Probably a two iron. I don't think you'll start it out over the ocean. I think you'll try and start it right at the middle of the green and try and hold it into that wind. The wind's blowing so hard, it's hard to hold it into the wind. And if you get it riding with the wind, then it won't stop on the green. The graphic told the story of the day. There's that Oklahoma background. How about that? There's a little run-up shot. So there you go. Beautiful to about 20 feet middle of the green. Thanks for coming. So the question is, how do you execute it? Because I must confess, this is where I can come into play here because I'm very good at this shot because I'm always in under the trees (laughs) trying to punch it low under the branches to get it back into play. But that's probably not the way you want to be coaching it. It's, it's interesting that I, I chose America for the run-up shot, knock-down <laughs> shot. Because it's probably the part of the world where you never get to play it because their conditions are that soft. Um, so in Australia, we have bouncy conditions. We have windy conditions. We have golf courses like Royal Melbourne, uh, which is a great example. But a lot of golf courses where it's wide open at the front and you can actually use that run-up shot in Australia, unlike America, where they put bunkers and soft greens everywhere. Um, so what do you got to do to... to to, to hit the, the knockdown stinger shot. Well, first of all, you've got to get your setup right. So you've got to get you got to get your narrow stance. You've got to get your spine fairly straight. If you want to hit a high shot, you go wide and tilt a lot. If you want to hit it low, you need to straighten up the body, your posture a little bit, and and not bend your right shoulder. If you're a right-handed golfer too low, you want to keep everything fairly straight. As as I said last week, arms relaxed, grip fairly relaxed. Feet, and this is probably a really important one, is to keep your feet a little bit open. You want to be able to use your body to really rotate through the shot. Um, if your body stalls on a, on a shot like this, you might flip the hands a little bit and uh, get it going a little bit higher. So feet a little bit open, aimed even a little bit left so that you can really rotate through the shot. Um, if anyone understands set up, you're almost setting up as you would be for impact. So you get your weight a little forward, narrow, feet a little open, and you'll press the hand slightly forward, de-lofting the club a little bit. Also, don't put the ball miles back in your stance. You've got a narrow stance. You just have the ball middle to even slightly forward so that you can rotate through the shot. Um, Three-quarter swing, sweep through, shallow as you can and 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 not too much of a follow through you want to almost chop off the follow through a little bit or um and keep the club face nice and square nice and strong through the shot um now what i see a lot of people do is they'll they think punch shot i want to hit it low they'll just have their normal stance they'll put the ball back too far back in their stance and they'll think they've got to hit down on it the problem with that is when they create speed with a seven or six, five, four iron, when they hit down on it with speed, they create spin and, and they get a little bit, little bit of lift. And then you get the wind, you get the ball lifting, and all of a sudden you're creating the opposite of what you want. Um, the bloke sitting in there with you, Dale Lynch, taught me this, and I think this is a great example, is to actually hit the ball softer than you normally would. The temptation of the wind, like everything in golf, is to make you hit harder. But if you hit it softer, shallower, with those setup and stances that we just talked about, you can actually take the spin off the ball and keep the penetration of the ball going low. Now, 
a couple of ways you can practice this is, first of all, learn the setup as I just described it. Practice that at, at your driving range, Yarra Bend, or preferably Ella Park driving range, because I'm <laughs> over there. Um, grab a five iron out, and what you want to do is set up that impact position so you push the hand slightly forward, de-loft the club just a little bit, narrow stance, almost slightly rotating the, the hips and the body slightly, and do a little almost run along the ground shot, just little half swings where the ball barely gets off the ground. And you start off hit five or ten of them and then you can start to hit a little bit harder, a little bit harder, until you get the ball flighting. And as soon as you get that uplift shot, you need to back it off a little bit and start again and just and just build your speed up. Um, and over time, you'll learn to hit that. And, and hopefully on the golf course, when the wind's blowing, on, on our coastal golf courses, you'll be able to bring it into play. Now, before I get Lynch's opinion on this, um, some, sp- some places you can really use this, and BJ's opinion, of course, um, <laughs> You can really use this off, off if you're up on a high tee and you've got trouble trouble left and right and you want to hit a low shot and just run it down the fairway. I see guys even with drivers that can hit these types of shots. Um, also, if you're slightly in between clubs, so you might have a back pin and you're, and you're scared one club's going to come up way short, the next club's going to go over the back. Well, you can take the extra club and hit it a bit softer and, and run it up to that back pin. Um, so... And you can also eliminate one side of the golf course a little bit. So if you hit a punch shot, you'll tend to favour one side of the course a little bit easier than taking a big full swing at it and, and, and getting the block right or the big pull left. So I know some of our listeners are not necessarily scratch markers, but I think they're capable of getting the setup right and practising that little um, that little knockdown shot and, and putting it in the bag eventually. Well, <clears throat> funny you say that, Spencer, because I do hit this shot a lot. And I, but I've actually, you might want to delve into it, but I've got a golf club built to actually play this shot too. So I do have a one-iron, just to brag. But the point of a one-iron is just to come out low and hard, particularly as you talk about the sand belt golf courses, particularly in summer, they get firm, fast, and windy. So I, I don't want the ball to go you know, any further than, say, 15 feet off the ground. But it's a shot, I, in particular, I use a lot off the tee. Um, and, on a lot of the par fours around any Melbourne Sandbelt golf course. And BJ, where, how far back would you take it when you're hitting that shot? Would you take a full swing at it or would you fall off the back swing sort of three-quarter position? Yeah, it's just like a, a little punch because the quicker I can get it on the ground and the, that's a, less likely I'm going to get in trouble too. So, And it's funny you say that when you, I got told a very long time ago, which is one of the best advice I've ever had in the wind, is when it's when it's breezy, swing it easy. So you yeah. talked about hitting it I softer. I thought that was a myth. It's actually true. It's, it's true. true, yeah. So less spin on the ball, less chance it can go sideways, spends less time in the air, so less chance it's going to be blown off line. So get it going along the ground. So it's a, it's a great shot. And I actually got taught a shot by Andrew Tampion back in the day, mm-hmm. of this shot that he used to hit because um, he was quite creative as a golfer. But um, it was pretty much a punch shot, but hood the club and just hit this like low hook, aim down the right side and just... Um, hit it hard and well not hard but just let it rip and then hit this low hook that just runs and finds a fairway do the old fairway finder and think... uh, Lynch a question for you yep um, the average punter are they capable of learning this shot in your opinion we're talking you know above 10 handicap up to sort of 20 oh, abs- markers well I was, what I was going to say too is that that by learning that shot particularly while you describe the practice which is what people don't do is by by practicing the shot like really short, soft stuff to begin with, you're actually, for, for the average golfer, they're actually understanding impact. Mm. Um, it's, it's actually one of the best exercises to, to understand impact is that short swing with, uh, as you said, and feeling, and, and feeling the loft of the club and your impact position on the ball. So I think that they're absolutely capable of doing it and, and the upside is it will improve and can improve the rest of the game. Yeah, it's probably really good for that guy that sort of adds adds dynamic loft so his hands get behind the ball at impact and uh, he he wonders why he hits behind it a lot and he hits that blade with his wedges sometimes and uh, this is a really good one to sort of teach him um, where the hands align with that impact position isn't it yeah absolutely 
Well, for 30 years, I've played off my back foot for that shot. Now I've got to change. <laughs> so you've really just ruined it for me, Craig. <laughs> Thanks very much. I thought well, you had Adam, to do... <sighs> Adam, seriously, now nearly everyone, they put it as far back, literally behind their... Oh, I do that. I Don't worry. I do that. Exactly that. And what they're doing is creating a really steep angle of attack with a lot of speed, and they're just putting tremendous spin on the ball. I wonder why I hit it to the tree straight in front of me when I'm trying to hit under it. Anyway, no, I'm going to check that now. That's one of the first things I'm going to do this afternoon is go and check that shot. Um, thanks very much for that. We'll catch you again next week. Thanks. Thanks, Craig Thanks, Spence uh, joining us there from the Albert Park uh, driving range. That's all we've got time for today. Why didn't you tell me about that shot when you saw me in the trees? I told you not to hit driver half the time you didn't listen to me. <laughs> it's not as exciting, though. <laughs> Dale, thanks for coming in again. I really appreciate it. I, I, I love that response, too, because it's not exciting. But it's not that exciting when you're down there whinging about how you miss another fairway and lost another ball. <laughs> but, what about when you, but what about when you reach the greening two and a par five? Yeah. You can, it's much more fun talking about that. <laughs> well, that's, that's a proper risk reward. <laughs> exactly, rather than boring but, golf. With that, with, with that low shot. As you narrow your stance, if you mimic an impact position from a narrow stance, straight away your spine is straighter. And then the opposite, if you really widen the stance and and mimic an impact position, your spine angle actually increases, which actually gets the ball yeah. in the air. That makes perfect sense. You, you see when, say, a Phil Mickelson plays the big flop shot from close to the green, he has a really wide yep. stance to create that height. Correct. And is there a way... I know we're running out of time here, but I'm sort of asking yeah, my mate, own I've got a tea time to get to. Oh, Come yeah, on. Finish. And I've got to hit balls <laughs> because I've found something. But I need it, to get to the range. But is it sort of the fundamentals of golf that you can actually learn from what Craig has just said about going to the range and actually hitting that sort of oh, half yeah. swing or even a it, third swing it, in that situation to understand and what even the club quarter, does it, and, and actually even quarter swing. Yeah. I, I use it a lot with a, a lot of my students of all levels when they're actually working on something. Because if, you, if you're working on the really short swing, because the club is moving slower, you can actually feel a lot mm-hmm. more. And it's really all it's about. You're actually trying to, you're trying to get the experience of that feel. So you, you swing it at a speed and a swing length that you can feel it. And as Craig said, then you just, you just keep ramping it up. If you lose the feel, you come back again. And then and just keep working, and then you you find as you keep coming back to that slower one, you you'll get further and further and further maintaining that same that same feel and that same flight you're after. I wonder how many people like me are listening to this going. Remember when you're out in the trees and you're trying to just knock it out on the fairway and you hit it through the fairway yeah. to the other one because the timing is so good Correct. because you've kept to your fundamentals. Yeah, and you find the middle of the club face. So when you swing <laughs> it, right. when it's breezy and you swing it easy, <laughs> but you're more likely to hit the middle of the club face. Therefore, it's going to go further and straighter. Learn a bit today. All right, we'll catch you next week. (laughs) RSN Podcast, all your favourite RSN shows and loads of new programs. You can listen all download wherever, whenever. And now we're on iHeartRadio, the world's number one radio and podcast app. RSN Podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts and at rsn.net.au. And now on iHeartRadio. It's free at your app store or head to iHeart.com.